normal times, a channel manager will typically be getting up early, jumping in the car, going to the station to get on a train or driving up a motorway or going to an airport to fly somewhere, right? Hello, welcome, and thank you for tuning into Channel Voices, the podcast for future channel leaders where we learn the ins and outs of partner ecosystems through casual conversations with channel professionals from a variety of industries, partner types, and geographies. My name is Maciek, and I'm your host. Today's guest comes with an eight-year channel experience gathered in companies like Kaspersky, Ipswich, and Keysight. In December 2020, he took on the position of head of channel at StealthBits Technologies. In this episode, he shares his know-how on the role of channel manager, and we find out how it's evolved over the years. Matt Scott New Jones, welcome to Channel Voices. Hey, Matt, how's it going? It's going really well. Thank you so much for joining for um, for this episode. Thanks for having me. I mean, Matt, you've been you've been in the channel for over eight years at this stage, um, and you've had um, multiple roles with multiple vendors where you have been managing the partnerships where you have been leading the channel strategies um i was kind of wondering if we could kick off maybe um and understand from your point of view and from your experiences what does the job of a channel manager entail yeah so it's it's a great question um it's so dependent i think it, let's, let's let's start with you know ch- channel is such a broad uh, sort of role uh, you wear multiple hats in many of the of the vendors that you work for. Uh, certainly, in the ones that I've worked for in the past, um, you know, you, you don't just wear the hat of a channel manager. And, and a channel manager is predominantly there to, you know, not only manage the partners' uh, relationships with the vendor, um, but also, you know, manage the relationship between a sales team and in, in, internally at your vendor is what I mean by that and the sales team at a partner as well. You know, you've got to bridge that gap. Um, so, you know, you, you're, you're, you're this kind of always this hybrid person of, you know, you're, you're, you're a relationship manager, you're an account manager, you know, salesperson in, in some cases, um, worn marketing hats in, in previous roles as well. Uh, so there's a lot. There's a lot to a channel manager, um, which some people might not be aware of, actually. Um, and I think I think even now, uh, even though I think channel is is growing as a, as a sort of as a as a as a role as such, uh, and people are understanding it more, businesses are understanding more. There's still a very big lack of uh, understanding in some uh, vendors as to what the channel do. Who are these? this strange breed of kind of salesperson, but not salesperson at the same time. So um, yeah, there's a, there's a lot that can go with a, with a role of a channel manager. That sounds um, very interesting, especially because we always think about, you know, the middleman is actually, is is the channel, right? Are are, are the partners. That's the middleman between the end user and the vendor. Um, But what, from what you're saying, you could be that middleman as well in between the vendor and the actual partner. And yeah, and th- there's one interesting thing that you mentioned because um, I don't think a lot of people understand that even though you're you're managing channel partners or you're doing business with channel partners, there's also that portion of your time that is dedicated to your um, to your internal sales team, right? Um, yeah, absolutely. And in what yeah. cases would you be would you be, I suppose, um, meeting with your internal sales team, um, and what would that entail typically? Yeah, so I mean, I would I'd even take one step further back from that before I get into that because uh, I think I think that the misconception even today it's it's not as bad as it used to be certainly eight years ago when I started, but there's this misconception still where there's a hierarchy and the vendor sees themselves on top. And I, I, it's all opinion, but I fundamentally disagree with that. I think you have to have a, a level playing field. Like everyone's on a flat level and you're all doing the same job, right? 
Without the vendor, there's no product to sell, absolutely. But without the partner, if you're doing a 100% channel, then there's no one there to sell sell your product, right? And then it goes into a deeper level. And I've worked for companies where, you know, everyone starts off, you know, in their career at the bottom rung as such, right? Um, and that's where you cut your teeth. It's, it's probably the most important role. And that is the internal role. And I think there's this, this conception of, oh, well, I'm an enterprise guy. So therefore, I know everything and I know what's best. Actually, yes, that might be true, but without your internal team, there's so much that you can't do. And I think internal teams are probably one of the most critical roles, especially for a channel manager, because ch- channel manager, you know, let's let's talk normal times, not what we're in at the moment. Normal times, a channel manager will typically be getting up early jumping in the car, going to the station to get on a train or driving up a motorway or going to an airport to fly somewhere, right? There are times of the day where you are completely offline because you're either in meetings, you're either traveling. So if you need a follow-up done or you've got something critical, you need to utilize that internal team to help you and support you. They are your support arm. And I've worked with some really great internal people over the over the you know last eight years and I, I if i'm honest i couldn't do my job without them and there was a point about three or four years ago where i didn't have an internal and it was really tough um because you you come out of a meeting and you're you're then crossing town to get to your next meeting but you need to do a follow-up action or you need to send a document to try and help uh, that partner salesperson that you've just met with uh, you know, to, to, to enable them to get to a customer quickly. So what do you do? You quickly phone your internal team and say, Hey guys, um, I've just met with, you know, partner a, uh, and, and Steve needs, you know, this document and this document, can you just send it over to him? Um, because he's going to have a customer call later and there's a chance that, you know, we'll need to be involved in that immediately. They can action that if it wasn't for that person sending that, there's no guarantee that I have access to that documentation on my phone, for example, and might not be able to access it on my laptop. So, you know, the, the, the internal role is, is critical. And, and I, that's where I started. Uh, I started as an internal channel account manager. Um, and I wouldn't be where I am today if I hadn't had that role and understood that role and really owned that role as well. So, you know, it, it is it's such a critical role to have because also they're the ones that are on the front line every day managing deal registrations managing opportunities with the salespeople at the partner but also internally so they're also that sort of bridge between the vendor and the reseller sometimes and also distribution if you bring distribution into it yeah so definitely yeah definitely a team effort um not only on Mm. the vendor side but also um with the partners and obviously as you go deeper into it and it's not one tier it's two tier I mean, there's more, there's more of that team there, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and and that's generally the thing. If you look at internal ratio to external ratio, you know, the internal workforce is always larger, typically, than your external workforce. Um, it has to be, you know. Uh, there are occasions where you may well find you have a, a slightly small, depending on the size of the vendor. You know, I've worked for larger vendors. I've worked for smaller vendors. Um, you know, sometimes smaller vendors don't have big internal teams, uh, but when they are growing, it's one of the key focuses that they do grow quickly. So you may well have, you know, one internal managing three or four external partners um, or account managers uh, workload. But as as that team grows, um, you know, generally you'll find that, you know, you have one account manager, internal account manager per enterprise account manager and, and can basically um and that's really important really important and in big vendors sometimes you'll you'll have an account manager uh you know a junior account manager and then an internal account manager you know and there's this there's this, this is almost a hierarchy of one role with three people in it um who have different functions you know but they all support each other so you talked a little bit about um you know how it how it is the the live of the 
channel manager on the road, being in the meetings with, with partners, trying to squeeze as many meetings into a day as possible. Um, not only because um, you need to move the business, but also because partners need attention, right? They, they do want to feel that they, that they are being looked after, that they're having those visits and it, that they don't wait for three months uh, until a QBR is due where you go and review um, the uh, past quarter's results. Um, so that partners definitely expect that um, type of um, treatment and care uh, and investment from the vendor side. But since yeah. this year, and obviously challenging year for a lot of companies and a lot of people personally, how how has that changed the role or has it changed the role? Uh, yeah, well, let's start. <laughs> um, it, it has changed the role drastically. Uh, actually, I think it's, you know, if we, if we can take a positive out of COVID, the channel, I think, has seen that positive result. Uh, sorry, no pun intended there. But, you know, th- when when we first locked down, um, the company I was with at the time uh, was very project driven, very enterprise driven. Um, and we suddenly saw, you know, the pipeline not drying up, not going away, but shifting. And we saw resellers um following stuff and we saw uh you know changes everywhere really in terms of how we had to suddenly engage with people um so the sales team were very quiet trying to reach out to people customers were obviously furloughed data centers were shutting etc you know um and it really was the channel's job at that point and role to step up and step in and maintain the contact where we could, you know, because Mr. Salesperson over here was talking to Mr. Partner, account manager in, over here, but that guy's now furloughed. So we've now got to find a different way to, you know, help them by saying, well, okay, they're furloughed. You're, you're, you're looking after their workload. What, what do we need to do to support you? And I think this is the thing. Vendors have had to support partners a lot more through this, this period um, rather than just relying on them to manage the opportunities. So uh, we had, I, th- I, think, I think if you look at channel as a whole, we all had to pivot pretty quickly and we learned on the go. You know, th- there were lots of things we had to try, which we had never tried before uh, to see, you know, how – we could manage partners virtually. I think it's been successful, actually. I, I think we've seen pretty good success. Technology today has really helped that as well. You know, video conferencing has has helped. Virtual events, being able to, you know, we, we did a virtual cocktail making, uh, you know, event one evening. And, and we had great success with that and great attendance. And it was a really great way to bring people together um, and have a chat, you know. And, and the technology has helped us get through this. Without that technology, would it have been successful? It might have been a bit more challenging, I have to say. Um, but with it, you know, I think it's been been really great. Um, the, the role channel has played over the last nine months, so I think has been critical. Um, it's been harder to onboard new partners in some cases. But in other cases, it's been very easy to engage because certain technologies – um have really lent themselves to the situation especially with home working you know there's been huge huge growth in two-factor authentication for example you know things like that um certain industries have had to grow and expand their networks uh so hardware requirements have gone up massively um and the channel have have been key in, in making sure that you know the connections are open and and the company is seen to be working in the background still, but also to update them. You know, I worked for a, for a predominantly hardware company uh, at the start of lockdown and our warehouses were shut. So production was shut, you know, so it was very much a case of updating distribution on a weekly basis to our key partners on a weekly basis as to A, what stock we had, but B, what the timescales were and what the lead times were. Um, I've also, I've had conversations with other people and I've also read in various media outlets, you know, 
uh, vendors who haven't been channel focused at all have started channel. They've built their own channel teams and they've done it during COVID. They've hired during COVID um, because, you know, they've seen the benefit that channel can bring and they've seen that channel is having a positive impact during these times because the relationships that channel hold aren't necessarily just about having a relationship with a salesperson. They are more around having a much wider, broader relationship into a business from, you know, account manager to marketing director to C-level, you know, that that's what's helped is that is the breadth of relationships that, that, that channel hold. So, yes, I think, you know, to go full circle, the, the role has changed. Um, but all we've done is we've adapted the way we work to a virtual model. And, you know, who knows, you know, the, the actual time scales. But if you believe what you hear going on right now, you know, by April, May next year, we could be back on the road. We could be back into almost a normal working pattern. I think people want that as well. You know, I think there are a lot of people getting fed up with the the virtual world, but you make it work and, you know, it won't be forever. And I think that's what people need to remember as well is it won't be forever. And channel can adapt to the way we need to work. We're very, very flexible in the way we work because we have to be on a daily basis anyway. So this was just a new challenge. Very good. Um, I suppose if there is one lesson to to take out of COVID and the whole situation this year is that channel can adapt very fast and use whatever resources and whatever technology it is out there to to help to achieve whatever whatever needs to be achieved, be it be it targets, be it um, be it customer appointments or, or whatever it is. These partners are still are still working. They still maintain those relationships with their end customers, and they do definitely need that extra bit of help from the vendor. But given that the vendor has um, been, I suppose, um, slightly affected when it comes to direct sales, and a lot of a lot of companies have been affected ma- affected massively by this. Um, they have recognized the the need for for a channel or maybe look at channel again and see where is it that they need to be making changes or additional investments um to help um to help sell f- further whatever it is that they um that they offer to the market yeah um, absolutely i i think it's I, I think it's a big lesson and that adaptability and that ever evolving channel I think it proves that um, this is definitely the the model going forward. And yes, we do. You know, we we might we might be going back to normal. You you seem to be very positive about this, and you know, maybe mid next year we will be back on the road and visiting customers and partners and whatnot. Um, but we have to prepare for the eventuality that it might not be like that, or it might never be that normal that we used to know. Yes. <clears throat> Absolutely. Even if we go back to normal, there are going to be differences. What they are as yet, we don't know, but there will be differences. I mean, uh, we we have had some some partners, for example, you know, say, oh, yeah, our offices are open. uh, But half our staff are out, half our staff are in, and then they flip them every couple of weeks and they rotate the, the, the pattern and they allow a certain number of vendors in with, you know, all the social distancing measures in place um and face masks etc etc um i think lockdown two as well has probably seen obviously is very different to lockdown one and depending on the area you know you live in or region but i think i think i think the the lessons that we've taken from this is you know the technology is good as well but i'm going to caveat that as well with you know people are suffering from webinar fatigue you know let's not let's not you know let's not be blindsided by this i don't think i've seen that many uh, sorry Matt. i don't think i've seen ever that many webinars advertised on on linkedin people just posting we have a webinar we have a webinar i mean on daily basis i mean if we if we attended every single one that was advertised we would never get any work done Uh, (laughs) and and i think that that has come to 
almost the point where we, we we've got to we've got to find again we've got to adapt again and this is what i mean about channel being able to adapt quickly is you know we've, we've hit webinar fatigue now you know we, you're seeing you're seeing attendance rates drop off massively both at partner level uh from distribution level from customer level you know we talk to partners and they say yeah we, we're not going to do any webinars now or attend webinars for a month you know we need a we need a cool off period so you have to adapt it again and you have to look at, okay, you know, when, when, COVID, when lockdown one started quiz, quiz nights were the big thing. Right. And yeah. I think it was probably about six to eight weeks and everyone was bored of doing quizzes. <laughs> weren't they? Right. Um, Absolutely. So, so now you have to find different things, whether that is, you know, uh, like I said, we did the, the virtual cocktail making event. Great. Really interactive. It's a bit different. You do as many pitch at the beginning, you talk about it uh panel discussions they're great because you're not talking about one technology and you're getting you know it's a very interactive session um uh, round table discussions things like that um but i've seen people do virtual wine tasting virtual coffee make uh tasting coffee tasting i mean brilliant you know it's different you don't want to do it at four o'clock in the afternoon but if you can get if you can get a load of people drinking some coffee at 10 a.m in the morning fantastic so there's so much out there that you can still do, which, you know, we can adapt to even if full blown, in inverted commas here, normalness never quite returns. Um, you know, there, there's a lot out there. And I think actually it's shown the business that a lot of the stuff that you might want to go out to on the road can also be done virtually. Now that might be a good, it might be a bad thing in certain cases, you know, that that's yet to be determined, but uh you know that sometimes there's an expectation that an external cam should be on the road four days a week maybe three days a week and they should have a minimum number of meetings that's great but the pressure then well okay you're targeting me for 10 meetings a week the pressure comes on is you're booking meetings for the sake of booking meetings and that's when it damages the relationship yeah. whereas i think with having to work virtually you're a lot more aware and conscious of what you're booking or who you want to talk to or who you need to talk to. And I think actually it's probably helped everyone become a bit more productive. And I think when, when you do have the ability to go back out on the road, I think a lot of, a lot of channel businesses will change. I know I certainly will be, you know, the, the way that they're, they're engaging, you know, I'm not saying you don't go and see your key partners once a week. If that's what they require, that's what you've got to do. But you may well not go and see those, you know, tier two partners, for example, uh, every month. You might only see them once every couple of months or once a quarter. Um, instead of just going to see them every couple of weeks because, oh, I was in the neighborhood, you know? Yeah. It's meetings for meetings sake. It doesn't work. And I think resellers are probably going to be wise to that as well, more so than normal, um, because they'll probably be saying, we don't need you in the office. And actually, when you are, you're you know, not wasting our time as such, but what's the value in you being here for that day? Uh, we talk for half an hour, we catch up, and then you, know, you sit at a hot desk, which is great. But if you don't need to do that, why not just do that virtually? Why not have that conversation virtually? You know, so I think I think there's going to be some changes, I think, in in the way that we approach, you know, the channel strategy and, and the way we actually operate moving forward as well. And Matt, um, on I suppose there there are those different challenges that that, that we face today. Um, we are somewhat used to it already. But from the channel manager perspective, what are the things that you believe are keeping them um awake at night what, what what are those things that they're that they're constantly thinking about what what are the issues that they're trying to either resolve or address or maybe even get a panel together internally and externally and try to resolve yeah i mean at the end of the day right everyone has a number to hit and the channel's no different you know the channel has a target whether that's revenue whether that's growth uh, whether it's just, you know, a, a set list of objectives, we've all got something to go out and hit and achieve. And a lot of companies now are, are getting ready for a new financial year. And there's a lot of uncertainty around what targets will be, you know, is, is there going to be a flat 
you know, is it a, a flat line or is it going to be a, a, a percentage increase year over year like, like normal? So I think if you talk to pa- partners at the moment, there's a lot of partners who, um, you know, they're still trying to work out themselves what their pipeline is going to look like next year. Well, that goes all the way back to the vendor. So that's the channel manager's job then to be reporting this back into the business, to their management team, to, you know, C-level management who are doing all the financial planning. I think that's what keeps a lot of people awake at night. For me personally, um, that's one thing that I'm not not concerned about um, or anxious about by any means, but it's something that's on my mind because, you know, I, I need to work out, well, if the business come back to me and say, yeah, we're going to, we're going to whack an 8% growth target on you uh, and the channel for uh, 2021. The thing that then keeps me up at night is, okay, well, how on earth am I going to do that? What am I going to do that's different? And I think that's the key is what can you do that's different? Because like we said earlier, the webinar stuff, everyone's doing webinars. Okay. Your products might be different, but everyone's doing webinars. It's all the same. So it's more around, Okay, what can I do that's different? What's going to stand out? What's going to highlight me as a CAM or as a leader or as a vendor? And what can we do? That's personally what keeps me up at night at the moment is what are we going to do differently in 2021 to make sure that we get those objectives and hit those targets? And remember, not all CAMs carry a revenue target. Some carry an overlay to a revenue target so they're not necessarily directly responsible for going out and actually closing the deal because you know that's what the sales team is there for right you know you have individual sales team for that but you are responsible for helping to generate that pipeline which ultimately then has an impact on that target and i think a lot of people that i've spoken to in the industry recently have said whether they're revenue based or not revenue based or whether they're an overlay, they've all said this a similar thing, which is where is our where is the where is our pipeline gonna come from and which sectors are, are gonna help us bring that? Because certain verticals right now are not gonna have any money to spend next year. You know, that's a reality. There are some which will, and there are some which are already spending quite heavily. But there are certain sectors and those sectors sometimes are, you know, very prominent for, for, for vendors and their solutions who aren't going to be able to spend or create budget on, uh, on IT, you know, certain IT stuff for next year. And I think that's quite concerning for, for some people. Yeah, absolutely. And so the year has been challenging, but it also has been exciting in, in, in a lot of different ways, I suppose. And for you personally, I believe you're now just about to um, open a new chapter of your channel book. Um, you're joining a new company? Yes. Yeah, I'm joining a, uh, a, a company called Stealthbits. Um, and I'll be heading up their their channel for uh, Amir and also APAC. Um, so, you know, Stealthbits are a US-based company. Um, we're looking to grow their presence in Amir and APAC. And uh, effectively what they do is uh, data governance and compliance software, making sure your data is uh, compliant, basically. And think about how great that that uh, opportunity is in the, in, in the current climate right now. Uh, you know, never mind GDPR and, and all the other data regulations around around the world so so yeah and and actually one of my tasks uh so i actually start there um in december and one of the first things that you know we've been tasked with as a as a a leadership team is to build the channel in emir and apac um which is really exciting because it's it's the first opportunity i've had to really build something from scratch for my own um yes they have a a model in place which we will probably use and adapt but um it's time it's times like this where you can really be inventive and creative and that's what i really enjoy about being in the channel is um 
it's okay to think outside the box. And I think that's really important, it's, especially if you're just starting out in channel. Um, you know, I'm not saying, you know, disobey your boss or disobey the rules or, you know, whatever. But, you know, don't be afraid to come up with some different suggestions and put them forward. Right. Um, you know, I think the, the, the really nice thing about the, the channel in, in, in terms of as, as a role is you can be creative almost every day because you, you want to try new things, you know, you, you want to try something that's different. Um, uh, when I worked for a, for a vendor uh, called Ipswich, I worked for Ipswich for four and a half years, um, started back in 2015. And I started there just managing UK. And then I went into the Nordics and then I ended up with Meta as well. So I had a big region and learning how different each region is to another and how they work and operate even in the nordics you know how differently uh how differently all four countries work to each other is 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 hilarious um but it, it creates a new challenge but it, it forces you to think outside the box at that point because what works in the uk doesn't necessarily work in germany for example or doesn't work in the middle east um and you, and i think that's something that I'm really excited about in the role that I'm going into now is we've got the opportunity to be creative and we've got an opportunity to, um, you know, create our own unique uh, selling point for the channel for, and for our program as well. So, um, yeah, a brand new chapter for me and a, and a, and a, and a much bigger challenge uh, than I've ever had in the past, but one that, you know, I'm really excited about actually and that I'm really looking forward to getting into absolutely congratulations um and we wish you all the best in the in your new role um, and as it is with new roles we we always be it a new role within existing company or you're changing you're going somewhere else and um, we do reflect on things we've done in the past and what might be relevant um, from our previous experiences and how would we do things today so with that in mind is there is there one thing that you wish you knew before you started your career in channel? Yeah, there are probably more than one thing, but I'll try and I'll try and focus it on one. I mean, like I said, don't be afraid to you know take risks, calculated risks. You know, don't just don't just say, oh, I need to spend ten thousand pounds on a on taking someone to a football event or something. You know, I'm not talking about that take it don't be afraid to take calculated risks and don't be afraid to speak up if you've got an idea don't just sit on it you know if you think it will work and you've done some research and you've done a bit of background work for it and you really think it will work don't be afraid to stick your hand up in a meeting and or a team meeting and say hey guys um i've had this idea i want to bounce it off you guys and and get your take on it and see what people say and how they react or, or go and speak to your manager privately about it you know I, I quite often do that you know I'll come up with something new and I'll, I'll phone up uh, I'll phone up my VP and say hey bit of a risk but what do you think to this and he'll either say you're dreaming or he'll say no I don't like that let's uh let's let's put some more thought into it and let's see what we can do so I'd say you know don't don't be afraid to take about you know calculated risks um I think I think as well though one of the things that I wish I'd known when I'd started is to understand the vendor you work for but also understand the different vendors out there um, and what I mean by that is is the different sizes shapes uh, sectors things like that not all vendors are the same and not all vendor channels are the same so if you're if you're currently a channel manager or looking to get into channel um, and and take that next step, understand the channel that you're currently in, and then if you're moving roles, look at the channel you're going into. Um, this was something that I I really learned, and and you have to learn quickly as well. So I went from a role where we were quite a we were probably a medium to large size vendor. And you had your usual suspects in, you know, the, in the top 10 platinum category of partners. 
And we would have channel management teams going in there every week, twice a week, into various different offices across the country as well as so dedicated teams. And I was lucky enough to then uh, inherit one of those large accounts. I won't say who. Um, and it was a wake up call because it works very differently. And there are a lot of people you have to get around and the way you have to work within those partners is very, very different. But you can build some really great contacts and you can build some really good relationships. However, I then moved to a smaller vendor. Networks are important, but don't just expect the door to be held open for you when you go to a new vendor. Because if you're not there as a vital part of the business for that particular partner, you're not going to get mind share. And it's very difficult to get back into some of those bigger players if you're a very small and very niche partner as well. You'll always do business with them. You'll always do business. But there'll be a difference between it being, uh, you know, a very reactive business rather than what you may well have been used to, which was a very proactive, uh, flowing business <laughs> uh, to say. So I, I would say, you know, that's one thing I wish I had known from the get go is that because you can waste a lot of time by trying to knock down doors that you think you can get into again because you've worked with them in the past whereas actually you've got to look at it and say well hang on a sec is that partner right for this vendor is it right for this product set no it's not well who do i need to go after well if you're a small very niche vendor where the product is very uh technically led you're going to need a smaller more technically enabled partner to drive that sale for you so sometimes it's being able to identify the right partners for your particular product and know when you've got a time waster on your hands as well so i'd say that's probably one of the biggest things i would uh, i wish i'd had when i started out because you know I, and i'm not afraid to say this you know i've made mistakes in the partners that i've approached and tried to onboard um and you can sometimes spend three months getting lip service before you really realize and see it so i think now well if i'd known that back then i would have come up with what i use now today which is like almost like a scorecard system to really identify and help me work out are they the right partner for me and also are you the right vendor for the partner it goes both ways so i think that's probably you know that's probably the biggest thing Thank you very much. That is definitely a very valuable piece of advice um, for a lot of channel managers and channel leaders out there. Um, and many times, I'm not sure if this is still happening, but in the past, you would have heard that if a US vendor wanted to enter, say, EMEA and start with the channel, they would have typically gone after the biggest distributors and tried to make some way there. And that was typically a flop and that, that would be that would have been something where they needed to learn and evaluate those partners and make sure that not only the partners are the right fit but are the partners interested and can they use that vendor solution to complement to whatever they have already in their portfolio yep absolutely and, and actually to your point there going after the big distributors big partners uh, big distributors in particular, a lot of them nowadays uh, might not actually take you on. If you're not doing the, the minimum revenue expectation of their business, expect uh, for their business units, and you're not hitting that expectation before you, you won't even get the first meeting. They'll look and go, no, that there's no point in us even doing that. Because A, it's going to take up a resources percentage of time. Um, and and there's no point there's no value in them doing that so there's that but also if you do get lucky and you do get taken on i say lucky um very loosely there but if you do get lucky and you do get taken on by one of the big players don't expect to have a dedicated team straight away you know and and don't expect them to do all the grunt work you know, you are still going to have to do a lot of the grunt work, especially in a smaller vendor. Big vendors, it's different because they generally have those relationships already set up. And if they're going to a new big player, it's generally because they're moving or opening up their distribution landscape. And, you know, they, they, they have a good uh, run rate flow of business, which is going to be attractive. Right. 
But if you're small in your niche and you're just starting out in the channel, not necessarily the best people to target. Look at smaller players. Look at uh, distributors who, you know, may well have complementary solutions in their portfolio, not just a bunch of solutions or competitors. A lot of people, for some reason, go for, for distributors and partners who, who sell their competition. I don't, I don't understand that. Um, I, don't, I, don't. I know, I know. I, yeah, I know of distributors that work exclusively with a vendor per yeah. sector. They would never take on, say, you know, a vendor and, and their competitor. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think as well, if you, if you can find them, that's great. But also look at who else they're selling. Pick carefully. Don't just think about your solution think about what other solutions they they have on their books because alliances are really strong at the moment and alliances with other vendors and technology alliances are growing rapidly at the moment because there's there's this there's a there's this thought process and it kind of goes back to the covid situation of well we we fit very well together so let's have a conversation and let's see how we can work collaboratively on some of the same opportunities and if we're bringing a new opportunity we can get you involved and vice versa that works really well and if you can find the right alliance you can really profit from it and really benefit from it absolutely matt thank you so much for being a guest on channel voices in this episode thanks for having me um i really hope that we get you um, booked on another episode. I, I feel like we we only um, we only scratched the surface of the role of the uh, of the channel manager. Like you said, it's that there's as a channel manager, you wear so many different hats. There's so many different things going on. Um, maybe after you get your feet on the ground um, in your new role, maybe we can get together again and see what um, what experiences have you brought to that company and how have you adapted and what else are you thinking about? I think it would be absolutely amazing to have you as a guest um, at least one more time. Thank you very much, Az. Really appreciate that. And yeah, it's, it's, it's been great being a guest. Thanks for having me. Um, it's, uh, it's a great podcast you've got that's, uh, that's growing and you're building. So I uh, really appreciate that. And I'd love to come back anytime. Thank you, Matt. You're always welcome. Thanks. And that's a wrap for this episode. I do hope you found it valuable. And if you did, please make sure to subscribe and leave a review. You can also follow Channel Voices podcast on LinkedIn, Twitter and Facebook. Or just visit channelvoices.com where you can send me a message or leave a voicemail. All of the links are listed in the show notes. And once again, I appreciate you tuning in today. Until next time. Thank you.